Hi, I'm Donna Lee Marcus, and for the past 43 years, I have been practicing cognitive restructuring. I have been changing the brain. I create instruments that change the structure of the brain so that the, you lay the foundation of learning in new ways to make your life easier and to make it less stressful and for you to be able to come up and generate uh, ideas that other people may not think of. Uh, cognitive restructuring involves context-free materials, which means just puzzles, forms of puzzles similar to IQ tests, that give you the opportunity to rehearse new learning patterns and to habituate these patterns in to your daily life. The patterns transfer, they transcend to life situations. If you learn to find my mistakes in my exercises, then when you write an email, when you write a paper, when you look at a contract, you have this ability to find errors in other pieces of material. You have like an, an error detector attached to you. And this, and it's habituated. You don't really think about it. My goal is to um, in, talk to you about the uh, aging brain and the opportunity that we all have to be super agers. That's, we all have the opportunity to exercise our brain and to incorporate different learning styles different patterns of behavior that affect our daily functioning, our short-term memory, and our visual imagery. The brain is inherently dynamic. It changes when we learn a new sport, when we learn a new language, when we solve a complex puzzle or problem, when we read a book. The brain is always changing and rewiring itself for uh, opportunities of uh, higher levels of functioning. If we look at the super-agers, we look at people who present themselves at 80 or over with cognitive skills that are on par with a 50 or 60-year-old person, we refer to them as super-agers because cognitively they present at a much younger age. If we look at the brains of these people, we can identify certain patterns of behavior. We identify certain skills they have that have contributed to their ability to function and delay dementia at 80 years old. The five primary characteristics that contribute to maintaining and enhancing cognitive health throughout the aging process are first, sleep, seven to nine hours of good quality sleep where the brain has an opportunity to um, eliminate waste products from the brain and to rejuvenate and restore the brain so that you can function differently after sleep. A protein known as amyloid beta is, is linked to Alzheimer's disease. Sleep gets rid of the amyloid beta protein. Sleep is the brain's way of housekeeping. Secondly, the reduction of stress through prayer or mindful meditation. We have an opportunity to reduce our stress. The environment is chaotic. We're all going to be surprised and have things that happen to us that are very stressful. We cannot control the environment, but we can control our response to the environment. And through prayer and meditation, mindful meditation, we have an opportunity to control our brains and to reduce this level of stress. And stress contributes, you know, it has a tremendous effect on our immune system. So we want to 
control our response because when we get upset, it sends signals throughout our entire body. Candace Pert, in 1972, when she was a graduate student at Johns Hopkins, uh, discovered that peptides, originally thought only to exist in the brain, actually had a very complex network throughout the entire body. Peptides are responsible for our emotions, how we interpret our emotions, the stress associated with the emotion. What Candace Pert was able to do was link the mind-body connection. And this is the reason why when you're upset, you may get a stomach ache. Or when you go through a lot of stress, it compromises your immune system and you find that you're more susceptible to viruses or colds or the flu or possibly even cancer. So we want to reduce our stress. We want to um, be able to control the stress. And the best way to do that is by learning to control the brain, learning through prayer and mindful meditation to learn how to slow the brain down, to control the brain, to reassess, to restart the brain so that you can function throughout the day, even when something very stressful or upsetting interrupts your thought process. Practicing mindful meditation does not have to be an elongated process of st sitting for two or three hours in one place and being, you know, in a mindful state. Two minutes before every meal and two minutes after every meal, two minutes when you wake up in the morning and two minutes before you go to sleep, of mindful breathing mindful meditation, and there are all kinds of opportunities presented on the web and on YouTube. Just practice mindful meditation for two minutes, eight to ten times a day, and you will begin to habituate to learn how to reset your brain. I've been practicing mindful meditation for 35 years. And in a moment's notice, I get upset, but I can control that upset. I can control my response, no matter how um, intense it affects me, by resetting my brain through breathing exercises that I've learned in mindful meditation. The third thing mild to moderate aerobic exercises. It's the media, television, news, the internet are all reporting daily research studies that indicate that physical activity, um, blood flow to the brain, enhances your ability to process information. Uh, so passively watch television. We want to be actively involved. We want to participate in life. We want to move. And movement has a big impact on our ability to age graciously. Current research recommends that in order to improve the flow to the cerebral cortex, individuals should participate in moderate aerobic exercise for 150 minutes a week. It's 30 minutes a day for five days. And certainly, once you start doing that, I think you start doing more. It's maintaining a very active lifestyle. It's walking through a mall instead of moving your car from place to place to get to a specific store. It's looking at housework as if it were an exercise and approaching it, bending down to clean the floor, 
um, sweeping, moving your arms in different ways. So that what you're doing in your daily tasks, your daily chores, actually is um, an exercise of sorts. And there's all kinds of research that indicates that if you have the mindset that chores are actually opportunities for exercise, that it has a 20% effect on your muscle development and weight loss. So it's all in your head. The fourth thing is social interaction. And social interaction makes you feel good. Being part of your family gives you support, makes you feel that you're connected, and allows you to, you know, sometimes take risks that you wouldn't otherwise take and to explore new things that you might not explore because you have the support of a family unit. So there is family where you have socialization. There is the larger um, group of socialization, whether it's a bridge group, whether it's um, basketball, whether it's an exercise club, if it's a book club, if it's a group of guys getting together from high school or college or graduate school of your old buddies from the army, whatever it is, these individuals give you the opportunity to learn about different cultures, about different ways of looking at the same problem. So this second group of socialization is very important to balancing how you view the world and how you see problems and how you adjust to the changing environment. The third group are kind of casual friends, casual people that you interact with at the grocery store, at a doctor's appointment, um, the postman that comes to your door, those incidental communications, being friendly, smiling, trying to make, make a connection with this person, making them feel better actually has a bigger effect on you feeling better all day. And if you smile at them and they smile back, it elicits um, a response similar to a drug. You're happy, and that's very nice, with no side effects, no negative side effects. The fifth thing that you should do to maintain a healthy brain is to engage in some cognitive activity. That's my wheelhouse, this I know about. And cognitive activities challenge the brain in novel ways. So learning a new language is nice, learning a musical instrument, taking a class. All of these things help engage you, help create, help strengthen weaker neural pathways. They change the brain. I look at neuroscience, and based on what neuroscience reveals, I create instruments that specifically address those areas of the brain all of my exercises are hierarchically organized. So they start simple and they get more complex. As they become more complex, they integrate ambiguity and multivariables. As they become more complex, I ask you to find my mistake and to correct that mistake. Anytime you make a mistake in any of my instruments, you're given the opportunity to find the error and to correct it, which gives you a better chance for neurogenesis, actually creating a new neuron or a neuro, neuro pathway, than for me to say, oh, here's the mistake, fix it. If you can find the mistake and fix it, it has a much greater effect on your brain, and that's what I care about. My goal is to create 
cognitive reserve, just like you have money in the bank for a rainy day or the unexpected. I want you to have neural pathways, to have neurons, to have cognitive reserve, to, to um, combat any unforeseen illness or event in your life. So we can have cognitive reserve and cognitive reserve is also a way that we can delay dementia. So I want to move all of my patients, all of my clients, all of the people with whom I have any interaction from passive recipients of information to active generators of new ideas. Thank you.